Amen, amen. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? God, it is truth and also refreshing to our souls to realize that we are resurrected by your power, the same power that raised your son from the grave is the very thing that saves us from the depths of despair and our own sin and our own muck and mire. It is also that same resurrecting power that will join us with you someday in a more physical way. God, we anticipate that. I'm homesick for heaven, God, and I can't wait. I can't wait to that moment where I get to be with you face to face and all of us again will enjoy no longer a picture of you like we do through communion, but enjoy your actual presence in a physical way. I can't wait for that. But thank you for being here already. Thank you for your tangible realities made known to us already. Thank for your spirit that is here already. And so God, I come to you as a broken servant and a broken cistern in some ways, asking for you to fill me up and use me and allow my mouth and my mind uh, to be glorifying to you. Lord, I know the things that have been prepared and the things I've prayed, and so I'm praying those things all come now to a way uh, for all of us that we will be touched and moved and changed. Unleash your spirit like a lion in this room and let the word of God not just be black and white letters on paper, but allow it to be living and active, piercing our hearts. Speak to us now, Father. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our resurrected king, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today I have the privilege of doing a wedding. After the service, I will take off and marry two people together uh, that are in our young adult group, Brian Hayes and Kaylee Gibbis. Kaylee's a lot like a little sister to me, so this is a special day to be a part of her wedding and to watch these two become one right before my eyes. I get the best seat in the house. I'm like 18 inches away from them, so I get to see everything happen, and I'm looking forward to it, but I was thinking about the wedding this morning, and I was thinking about the promise that they'll make to each other to be faithful. I was thinking about the vows that they're going to take and the vows that they're going to make in front of everybody uh, will be vows where they are promising in sickness and in health for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse, I promise to be faithful to you. I promise that as long as we both shall live, we will remain in this even when. I couldn't help but think about their their wedding and, and the beauty of it. And in my own marriage, I have experienced even more so recently the beauty of of a commitment to one another, even when things are hard, even when life hits bumps. It's amazing how marriage has been used in the Bible since Genesis, but all the way to Ephesians in the New Testament, and we see it even mentioned in Revelation in some ways, as this analogy of loving God even when. And you can't help but think about the vows in a marriage. You, if you've been married, you know what it's like to take a vow in front of the other people and say, I'll be faithful to you even when. We'll, we'll go through even the hardest times, the poorest times, the richest times, the sickest times, the most sinful times. We're, we're going to go through all those things together even when, even when those things happen. I'm with you. And, and the Bible uses this picture of marriage as a beautiful picture of the gospel, that God is faithful to us even when even when we fail him, even when we are unfaithful, even when we doubt, even when we're sick, even in scarcity, he's faithful to us. The Bible uses the picture of marriage and even the idea of wedding vows throughout scripture as an idea of what he does for us. He is ultimately the groom. We are the bride. He's faithful to us no matter what. It's a beautiful picture. And if you think about vows, vows in a wedding, they truly anticipate that there are going to be hard times. Wedding vows anticipate that bad times are going to come. And when we use that analogy for our Christian faith, then we also can understand that following Christ, as depicted by the illustration of marriage, means that we realize that there are going to be hard times, bad times, sinful times, times where we have nothing and times where we have everything. But in every time, we remain faithful to him. And even more so, he remains faithful to us. 
I've entitled my message today, Living for God Even When. Living for God Even When. And building off of the idea of marriage, I want to challenge you today. I want to interact with your heart in such a way where I get you to at least think about, am I faithful to God even when? In the midst of crisis, do I remain faithful to him? In the midst of doubt where I can't see him and I don't understand what he's doing, do I remain faithful to him? I hope that you will question and prod your own heart today to ask do I live for God even when? And today I want to dive back into our study on Daniel, and I want to show you a man who did truly remain faithful to God even when he was surrounded by corrupt culture, even when he was surrupted by, surrounded by corrupt kings, even when he was surrounded by corrupt cohorts, guys who served with him. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up with me to Daniel. Chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11 today, and this is found on page 743 in the Bibles in front of you. I want your eyes on this passage. You can follow along in the notes in our Grace Chapel app as well. You can take notes on the back of the bulletin, but I want this story to pop and come to life. Now, I'm very familiar that Daniel 6 is a common story most of us know, but I'm hopeful that you will meet it today and next week afresh, and you will ask yourself the question, can I live like Daniel even when? even when. As you turn there in your Bibles, I want to give you the main theme for this passage. Uh, I think the main theme is this. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. A life lived for God will remain outwardly devoted to him even when. The phrase I want you to see is outwardly devoted. Yes, of course, you'll be faithful to the Lord even when, no matter circumstances that come your way, your own poor decisions, or the consequences of your own poor decisions. My hope is, no matter what, you will stay faithful to God even when. But I hope that there is an outward devotion. Devotion to God is not something that it should only be private and inward, as we'll identify here today. It should be something that is outwardly displayed in our life, because I believe true devotion cannot be hidden. It doesn't waver in situations where we feel hopeless. It doesn't waver in situations where we feel helpless. We are outwardly devoted to God no matter what, because he remains so devoted to us. Now, let me remind you of the context of this. You can peek at the other chapters that we've been in. We're reading here these first six chapters of Daniel, which are really snapshots of some young men that were taken, exiled out of Jerusalem and taken to Babylon. Daniel was captured as a young man, a teenager in chapter one. And now we're meeting him probably in his mid 80s in chapter six. So we've had these snapshots of his life along the way. We have uh, understood that these people have been taken away from everything that was familiar to them. They even were taken away from the holy temple that King Solomon built in Jerusalem. The temple is destroyed. Jerusalem is destroyed. And now they're having to live in Babylon. It would have been easy for them in some regard to think, well, we're now in Babylon and let's just do as the Babylonians do. Let's just kind of go along with this thing. It's been nearly 70 years that they've now been exiled in this place of Babylon. And so they could have thought, well, God has forgotten us and God is nowhere near us. But they had to remain devoted even when it felt like God was nowhere to be found. And these Israelites, they could have started to lose hope in God, but while some may, may have been giving up on God, God never gave up on them. And I believe there was one man, at least, Daniel, who continued to remain faithful. He knew God had not given up on them. Daniel knew that God was still going to restore his people. God, God was going to bring them out of captivity. He was going to return them to their, the land that they had been taken from. He knew all of that. So he remained devoted, knowing that God was remaining devoted to them. As we enter this sixth chapter of Daniel... You're going to see that Nebuchadnezzar is nowhere to be found. He was the ruler who was over the first four chapters. Nebuchadnezzar's gone. Belshazzar's gone. He was the guy in chapter five who had uh, to experience the writing on the wall, men, men, a tekel parson, this hand that wrote on the wall. And Daniel had to interpret it for him. And Daniel basically said, this is the end for you, King Belshazzar. And sure enough, that night, the Euphrates River was cut off and the Medo-Persian armies marched in under the walls and took over Babylon. That's the end of Babylon, chapter 5. The Medo-Persian rulers and armies are now over Babylon. And we're going to meet this Medo-Persian king who is now ruling 
in verse 1. Look at it. It says in verse 1, it pleased Darius. He's a Medo-Persian king, so no longer just for Babylon, for a larger area. He is now, it now pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. Now, Darius recognized this government that he took over was massive. This land that they had captured, including Babylon, was no small chunk of land. Think of it as almost the entire Middle East as we know it today. That's the land that he was over. Uh, if you can't get your mind around that, try to think about Canada coming down and capturing America. It could happen, right? They come down, they capture us. This this large territory. We're all drinking milk from a bag. And, and it's a big, massive, massive piece of land that needed a lot of leaders. That's how he saw it. He saw this is a big land. I need lots of leaders to oversee the land. So he sets up 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. Verse 2. And over them, there were three high officials of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps give account so that the king might suffer no loss. So just to help you understand what's happening here, the hierarchy. So you have 120 basically people over different states or providences. And then there are three presidents who are over those 120 satraps. Uh, most of us have never been a satrap. Most of us have never met a satrap. When we golf, we get into the sand trap, but this is totally different than that, okay? So let me explain to you what a satrap is. A satrap is basically a man who oversees a providence or a state, and he's making sure that everybody in that state gives their tributes to the king. Or another way we would think of it is taxes. They're making sure that those tributes or taxes are given to the king. And then there are three officials or three presidents who are over the 120 satraps. And Daniel was one of those three presidents. The NIV even translates it that way. He was one of the presidents over the satraps to make sure that the king suffered no loss. Look at verse 3. There's something different about Daniel, though. It says, Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. It says Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials. Why? That's not a rhetorical question. Looking for involvement here. The answer is in the book. Why was he set above or distinguished above the others? Because he had an excellent spirit within him. This is the same thing that we saw in chapter 1. All the way back to his teenage years, there was something different about Daniel. He had an excellent spirit within him. He was different because he had character, and he was different because he had the favor of God upon his life. Well, the other officials didn't like that. They didn't like that for one second. They didn't like that this man who was a foreigner, an exile of Judah, was now given this kind of favoritism, so much so that it says here in the passage, the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. That's like making him equal with the king. They didn't like that. So they started getting jealous. We've seen jealousy before. Think about what happened in chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because three guys remained devoted. I think the lesson we can learn here in Chapter 1 is Daniel's devotion to God set him apart. If you're taking notes, write that down. Daniel's devotion to God set him apart. King Darius had favor on Daniel. He knew what Daniel had done for the other kings before him. He, he'd heard the stories about him being able to interpret dreams when nobody else could. He knew that he could interpret the writing on the wall with that crazy hand thing that happened. He, he knew that there was something special about him. And ever since chapter 1... Daniel's continually risen to the occasion to be trustworthy and responsible and full of integrity. Every time he's promoted, he rises to the occasion. And verse 3 says, it's because he has an exceptional spirit in him. His life was notably different because of his character and because of the hand of God on him. There's an application in this for us. The application is this, a life lived for God cannot go unnoticed. When we live for God in faith, when we act out of obedience, it will display on the outside. It will display in our words and it will display in our actions. It's not just something that's internal, but it has an outward appearance of an internal devotion. 
When we live right for God, I believe that the credit for our life ultimately goes to God. And when people start figuring out, oh, that guy's devoted to God and he keeps getting promoted or wow, she is so blessed in so many ways. Look at how she continues to conduct her life, even in the midst of hardship. What's different about her? It's her devotion to God. A life that is devoted to God will not go without being noticed nor should it ever be hidden for the world to see. Let me give you an example. Last week, I'm sitting at this amazing dinner, probably the the best meal I've ever had in my entire life. I'm enjoying such a great time with my wife for our anniversary. And I said to the server, I said, can I please speak with the manager? And he said, sure, I'll send him right over. The manager comes over. I'm telling this guy, hey, you're not going to believe this. This was the best service I've ever had. This was the best food I've ever had. Thank you so much. And somewhere in the course of our conversation and me doting on the restaurant and the food and my full belly, I said, I was a pastor. I don't exactly know how that came out, but it came out. And when when the pastor thing comes out, it's always odd to see how people react to that, right? And so all of a sudden he starts reacting and he and he's saying things. He's 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 skirting around something. I'm not sure exactly where this train is headed, but it's it's going somewhere and I'm on it, right? And he's just kind of He's talking and I don't know where we're going. And finally, he like leans in and he whispers and he says, I'm a Christian too. I go to church. And I was like, great. That's great. No. Yeah. I go, yeah, I'm a Christian too. And I don't know why he was whispering. I don't know why that was a secret. I wanted to say to him, bro, you don't have to whisper about that. In fact, you're in an industry that desperately needs you to be bold about that. Your light should be light in the darkness of even the hospitality industry. My friend, you should be bold about your faith in Christ. You don't hide it. Now I get it. He might have had reasons that I don't understand about why he was trying to be hidden with his faith. But I don't think we ever have to hide our faith. I've heard it said that while our faith is personal, it's never private. We don't want to force our faith onto people. I understand that. They need to make their own personal decision. But I shouldn't have to be private about my faith. And Daniel wasn't private at all about his faith. He wasn't pushy, but he was devoted. He was resolved. He was focused. Because he realized that his faith in Yahweh, the one true God, was central to his existence. Belief in God was not an add-on to his life, but, but his belief in God was the very thing that transformed his life. And when we claim Christ, we should be as open about our faith as we are about our love for sports or our love for good food or our love for hobbies or our love for talents that God has given us. When Christ is our passion, we talk about him because we talk about what we're passionate about. We talk about it. Daniel didn't talk about it. He also lived it. And we need to do the same. Thank you for the amen. (laughs) Matthew 5 says this. Matthew 5, Jesus is saying, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, he says, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our faith though it may be personal, is not meant to be private. And our own Savior says, live out, proclaim, act upon the goodness of God in your life and make sure that others understand that you are saved by him, that you believe in him, no matter the critics you face. Live boldly for him. (laughs) No one could find any fault in Daniel. There was no way to find fault in him except with his God. And you can see what they did in verse 4 and 5. It says, Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground of complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Daniel had such impeccable integrity that the only way they thought they could accuse Daniel of anything was by using his devotion of God or to God against him. They knew that they could force him to have to choose between his God and the law of the land, and he would choose his God every time. He would not back down. 
So they saw this as a weakness. They thought it was weak of him, and they thought they could destroy him if they could make him make a decision between the law of the land and God. But I believe this was not a weakness for Daniel. Daniel's perceived weakness was actually his strength. His devotion to God was where he gained his greatest strength and his favor from God. His devotion to God had the hand of God upon him. I wrote in the margins of my Bible, Josh, this is your hope. Stay devoted, faithful, and God will remain faithful to you. You see, it wasn't a weakness that he was devoted to God. It was his strength. And he was unashamed to make that known at every opportunity he had. There's a lesson in this for us, too. I think it's this, though we may not live in Babylon, we live in a culture that has a Babylonian mindset. And what I mean by that is Isaiah chapter 47, verse 8, talks about the Babylonians lived with this idea that I am and there is no one beside me. We live in a culture like that, don't we? Where they walk around, I am and there's no one beside me. I do what feels right in my own eyes. But as Christ followers, we must be unashamed about living for God and not for ourselves. We're unashamed about it. And we live in a culture of tolerance and everybody says coexist and we'll all get along and all these things. And we say that we're tolerant, but let's be honest. Our culture is intolerant about our belief that there is exclusivity to God through Jesus Christ. Yet we don't back down from it. And in Daniel's world, they too were seemingly intolerant that he believed that there was only one true God, Yahweh, that there was only one true God of Israel. They struggled with the way that he believed Yet they could find no complaint, no fault, no error in him, except that he was faithful to this one true God. So I put in my Bible, I said, he was blameless. Daniel was blameless. No complaint, no fault, no error. Are you kidding me? That's amazing. He was blameless. Now get me clearly, he was not sinless, but he was blameless. Blameless and sinless are not the same things. He had sin in his life. He probably had to correct that sin, repent of that sin, change time and again. But he continued to strive to live out a life of integrity and be blameless. He did everything he could right. And where he was wrong, he came back to righteous living immediately, living loyal to God. This was not his weakness. This was his strength. And we should pray that the same thing could be true of us. We should pray that that we also would be considered in such a way that we would remain faithful. Yes, we're not sinless, but we're faithful. Well, I'm embarrassed that there have been moments in my life where I have allowed my sin to make me blameful. I can accept the mercy and the grace of God to get right back up and pursue him in devotion, even when, even when. And knowing that he'll be faithful to me, even when. I strive to live a life for him. I strive to live out obedience for him. And while we're called to be blameless, above reproach, meaning that we strive for blamelessness as a characteristic of our life, there will be times we are not perfect. And God is not looking for perfection, but he's looking for us to be like Daniel, where there can be no complaint or no fault found in us. And I'm telling you, my friends, this doesn't come by our own strength. This comes by the consistent provision of God in our life. I wrote this down for my own application. The power of my life is found in the strength of God, and the world will not always understand that. The power of my life is found in God's strength, not my own strength. As I live for God, I'm going to have critics. I'm going to have tangible and intangible enemies. I'm going to have people who try to take me out and they try to see my loyalty as something that they can charge against and peg me against God or the world or the law or what have you and try to take me out. And all the while, I have to keep coming back and say, listen, I cling to him as my strength. I cling to him as my strength. I don't care if you think it's a weakness. You could call me dependent all day long because I'll be the first in line to say I have to be dependent upon him. The Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, 
This man understood what it was like to be sustained by God. And he wrote probably in the last recorded letter we have of his life to his young friend and mentoree in 2 Timothy 4.17. He wrote this. This is becoming one of my favorite books. And this is my verse for life right now. He says, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Paul had to be thinking about the story of Daniel. And while he was not thinking about physical lions, though Daniel was threatened to be eaten alive by lions, Paul's thinking about these lions, the lions of the enemy that roar around us, trying to kill, steal, and destroy us. And yet God is so faithful to shut their mouths. It's not by my own strength, but it is the strength of, of God that protects me. And my strength is found in my devotion to God and his devotion to me every time. Daniel knew his strength came from Yahweh, the one true God. He didn't flinch when his companions who turned enemies, these were guys that he probably counted as friends, now they're enemies. He didn't flinch as they conspired against him. Look at verse six of Daniel Six, it says, then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. And all the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions." Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. There's a couple things that are clear to me at this point in the narrative. The first and most important is this. Daniel's devotion to God was not determined by the circumstances around him. His devotion didn't come out of a moment of crisis when he's like, okay, now I better be devoted. But he was remaining devoted, unwavering in his devotion, no matter the circumstances around him. Like marriage vows, we live out our commitment no matter the circumstances. No matter what, even when we remain faithful and keep our commitment. So Daniel as if he has this vow with God, which he did. He believed, he, he coveted himself with the Lord. He was living for Yahweh. He was devoted. He continued to live for Yahweh, the one true God, no matter the circumstances. Now here's the circumstances. The passage says, all of them came to the king. I don't buy it. But it says all of them came in agreement, came as a group, came flooding, literally could be the translation, into the king's presence. And all of them in agreement start telling the king, listen, we think you should make out this decree, a decree that we worship only you, our king. Now you have to understand, this is a polytheistic culture. They believed in many different gods and they had no problem believing that the king was God, right? So they would say it's okay to pray to the king among other gods. But what these guys were saying is we need a monotheistic culture for 30 days, We need 30 days where there's one God we praise and that's only you, king. It's only you. All of them agreed on that? I don't buy it. Not even for a second. There was no way they all bought that. 120 satraps are probably out in their providences. Half of them probably didn't even know about it because they all still wanted to pray to their other gods. But the handful, two handfuls, a couple dozen that are in there are creating such commotion for the king that he buys it and he's like, oh yeah, that sounds actually like a really good idea. We should do that. And they propose even the end. Listen, if, if they don't do this, king, if they pray to any other god, then let's throw them into the lion's den or the lion's pit. The lion's pit was their way of doing capital punishment. What it was is it was a cistern. A cistern was a large cavern or cave that was dug out, usually by human hands. Maybe it started as a cave and dug deeper by human hands, and it would be used to capture rainwater. Well, sometimes those cisterns would break, They would have a leak. The water would no longer stay in them. So they would repurpose the cisterns. And one of their new purposes was to put lions down in there and use it for capital punishment. That if anybody was disloyal, 
they would throw them into the lions, then put the rock over the top of the cistern, and we would let the lions have at it. So this was their proposal. The king's like, that doesn't sound like such a bad idea. 30 days, everybody's worshiping me. It sounds like a way to unite the kingdom under this new king. It sounds like it will show people's loyalty. It'll test their loyalty to me. It sounds like a win-win situation. Let's go for that. Yeah, yeah, 30 days, I'll do that. And all the while, they were setting a trap for the king's friend, Daniel. Verse 8 clarifies what the king put in writing. No one could revoke, not even him. It's because the Medo-Persian law worked that way. If a law was written even by the king, the king could not change it. The satraps and the other two presidents, they knew this, and so they tricked the king. Even at this news reaching Daniel, he, he didn't flinch. Circumstances didn't change his devotion. He remained devoted. And we too need to realize that the world, our enemy, and even our own flesh at times will conspire against us. But we must have lasting courage found only in Christ. Here in this moment, he could have lost all courage. He could have said, I'm going to go a different way. But he didn't. He remained faithful. And I say to you, my friends, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, I guarantee you, you will face persecution. Jesus himself said in John 15, verse 20, they persecuted me first. And so they're coming after you. And Paul also wrote to Timothy in that same letter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. He said, indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's no if about this. If you live for Christ, there will be some who come against you. The devil and the unseen realm will come against you. Others will come against you. Persecution is part of the job description of being a Christ follower. You will face it. Yet, my friends, we remain encouraged. Encouraged. It's literally having courage poured into us. Courage that comes from Christ that allows us to stand in the face of adversity. After mentioning many Old Testament heroes in Hebrews chapter 11, the author of Hebrews says about these great men and women of God, and they had to be thinking of Daniel as well, that they stood firm for God. And in verse 33, it says, and through faith they conquered kingdoms, they enforced justice, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the power of fire, they escaped the edge of the sword, they were made strong out of weakness, I love that part, and became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. These great heroes of the Old Testament, including Daniel, remained faithful even when, even when. Daniel, even when the darkness of decision to worship only the king had been made, he didn't back down, he didn't run and hide, he did what he had been doing and been devoted to do and resolved to do and focused to do his whole life. Why? Because he trusted that God was devoted to him. Look at verse 10 and 11. It says, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber. He opened it towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. The beginning of verse 10, he knows the document is signed. The end of verse 10, nothing changed. He kept doing what he had done before. And then the men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before God. Listen, Daniel didn't change a thing in the face of danger. Daniel's devotion to God in the midst of crisis was previously determined in his moments of peace. He had already determined before there was a crisis that he would remain devoted to the Lord. And then when the law passed, it didn't change his behavior. My friends, circumstances don't dictate our disciplines. Conviction does. Conviction determines our disciplines and our devotion. And Daniel was willing to continue to pray to the one true God, even with the threat of death upon his life. He wasn't in some kind of passive rebellion, but he was in active devotion to God. 
So he went up to the upper chamber, knowing that this decree had already been signed, and he starts to pray towards Jerusalem. He remembers what was said by King Solomon in 1 Kings and the dedication of the temple, that there the presence of God would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And even though Jerusalem had been wiped away and King Solomon's temple had been wiped away, he faced Jerusalem as if to say he believed the promise that the one true God was still active and living. And he got down on his knees and he prayed. And he prayed to this God that he knew was still alive and knew was still capable to save him. Three times a day. He could have stopped for 30 days. He could have said, well, I'm just not going to pray for 30 days, or I'm going to pray in my bedroom for 30 days, or I'm just not going to make this so public for 30 days. I'll just pray at night when everybody else is sleeping for 30 days. But no, what he had determined to do in times of peace, he would continue in the face of criticism and crisis. My friends, what we value most will determine what we live for the most whether it's in times of peace or in war, of trial or of triumph, of abundance or scarcity, what we value the most will play out in what we live for the most. Daniel could have chosen to be petrified in fear. He could have chosen to snap right into self-preservation mode, but he didn't. He didn't, not even for a second. Rather, he kept going. And he did what he had done every day for the previous 70 years of his life. He remained devoted. He remained resolved. He remained focused. My friends, we can kick and scream about not getting our way. We can kick and scream about not getting what we think is right. Not getting the justice we think we deserve. We can be all mad about it. And usually when we do that, we're demonstrating what we value the most, and that is us, ourselves. But if we really value Jesus Christ above all things in our life, then we're going to push ahead with devotion. We're going to push ahead in faithfulness, even when, even when circumstances are not in our favor. Even when critics speak up against us even when we will continue to live for God, even when, even when the pressure is high, even when the persecution doesn't stop, even when we're living through the circumstances of our own sin and have to press through with repentance, even when in all of those situations we live for God, we know that, my friends, he lives out his glory and his purposes for us. He remains faithful to us even when, and he asks for us to remain faithful to him even when. I leave you with this one final thought. Character, which I said Daniel has, and I hope that you have as well. Character is victory. Character is not a gift. God does not automatically give us character. Psalm 1, among many other passages, call for character, call for righteous living. The Bible commands us to have character. Character is victory. It is not a gift. God does not just come in and say, here, I'm going to make you a robot, live this way. Yet he remains devoted to us even when we are not devoted to him. And he sees our devotion to him and our right living to him and our complete repentance for what we've done wrong to him. He sees all of that as a way to build perseverance and hope and character in our life, as Romans 5 says. He allows the circumstances we go under to produce character, but he doesn't give us character. But what he does give us, what he does give us, is he gives us the Holy Spirit who labors with us and walks with us and remains devoted to us so that we may continue to have a clear outward devotion to him. So my friends, my prayer for you, my prayer for myself, my prayer for us as a church is that we will be people who have an outward display of devotion to God even when. Will you pray with me?
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the loving kindness that you show us. You give us more than we could ever ask or imagine through your Son, Christ. And God, we even thank you for circumstances that we have to live through that produce in us perseverance and hope and character. Father, I pray that you will help us be people that live for you even when. And as we go back into our homes and our workplaces this week, will you help us be faithful even when? And will you continually remind us that you are always faithful even when we are faithless or even when we fail you? Thank you for being always faithful. And thank you for proving your faithfulness to us through your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.